So let's spend some time going through the facts and how evolution explains them all so well. First, fossils. Now fossils provide really good evidence for evolution. And by studying these fossils, we can see how organisms have changed throughout the past, as we're able to see the small incremental changes that took place over millions of years. The farther back we go, the more we see that everything alive has evolved from a single starting point. Fact evolution. We're able to see all incremental change. Fossils provide really good evidence for evolution. Yeah, that's what I was taught in school too. But is the fossil record really good evidence for evolution? I asked Dr. Gunter Beckley, a fossil expert. He has discovered 180 new species in the fossil record and published over 160 scientific papers. It is often believed that the fossil record is great support for Darwin's theory. Actually, this is not the case at all. The theory predicts slow changes, but the fossil record shows rapid changes. The theory predicts that new forms accumulate by addition of little small steps, but the fossil record shows they appear out of nothing suddenly. Let's start with the most famous sudden appearance of life forms in geologic history, the Cambrian Explosion. Geologist Casey Luskin explains. Nearly all of the major living animal phyla appear abruptly in the Cambrian period in a geological eye blink, a five to 10 million year window. In the Cambrian explosion, we see many diverse body plans appear without any direct evolutionary precursors. In fact, one invertebrate zoology textbook says that the animal phyla appear fully formed such that the fossil record is of no help to understanding how these species and these diverse body plans arose. But is the Cambrian explosion the exception? Because we usually hear, the fossil record clearly demonstrates that organisms don't suddenly appear. The phenomenon of sudden appearances in the fossil record is not just an exceptional case, but actually is a pattern that is found everywhere. The origin of life, the origin of photosynthesis, the Avalon explosion, the great Ordovician biodiversification event, the Silurio-Devonian terrestrial revolution, the Devonian nekton revolution, and the odontote revolution, the Carboniferous insect explosion, the Triassic explosions, the origin of flowering plants, the origin of butterflies, the Neo-Avian revolution of modern birds, the placental mammal radiation, the origin of the genus Homo, and finally the Upper Paleolithic human revolution. Now that is a serious list of big jumps in the fossil record. If you look at the technical literature, we can see references to a fish explosion, a bird explosion, a dinosaur explosion, a mammal explosion, and even the origin of our own genus Homo has been referred to as a big bang theory of human evolution. Because we see in throughout the fossil record, different types of organisms appearing abruptly without this gradual change that Darwin's theory predicted. In the middle of the Carboniferous period, we find the first flying insects. And the striking thing is there are no fossil precursors for them. There are no credible transitions. Just presto, this fully articulated marvels. Just how bad is the fossil record for Darwin's theory? Anthropologist Jeffrey Schwartz, who supports evolution, is blunt. Most major groups of organisms, he says, appear in the fossil record, full-blown and raring to go in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution. Some scientists say the transitions in the fossil record just look abrupt, and that we'll find the gradual transitions if we just keep on digging. Beckley thinks that explanation is no longer credible. And here's why. Imagine you have a new hobby and you walk along the beach and you collect starfish and shells and snails. Every day you find something new, but over time, repetition sets in and ultimately you reach a day where you only find over and over again what you already found. And then you know that you have sampled enough to know what is out there. Exactly this method is applied in paleontology to statistically test the completeness of the fossil record. It's called the collector's curve. In most groups of organisms, we know that the fossil record is sufficiently complete to be sure that the gaps that we see are not artifacts of undersampling or of an incomplete fossil record, but actually data to be explained. Some evolutionists basically admit that the many expected transitional fossils don't actually exist. They argue that the fossil record simply didn't have enough time to record the transitions. 
That was the view of two leading evolutionists who proposed a theory called punctuated equilibrium. Which said that basically species change so abruptly they don't have enough time to leave any transitional forms, and that was how they accounted for the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record. But punctuated equilibrium has a problem. If major transitions really took place too quickly to be captured by the fossil record, there would be even less time available for genetic copying errors to accumulate into beneficial features, and evolutionary theory already faces a huge time crunch. When we do mathematical calculations using standard textbook methods of population genetics, there simply is not enough time in the fossil record for random mutation and natural selection to produce the changes that we observe. Let's look at whale evolution. Whales are said to have evolved from a land mammal in under 11 million years, but was that enough time to produce all the mutations required to create a whale? Richard Sternberg has two PhDs in biology and was a researcher at the Smithsonian. He has studied the evolution of whales in detail. Imagine you were going to take your Volkswagen and have a, a submersible that could go down a few thousand feet. Well, how many engineering changes would you have to make to your vehicle to accomplish that? Well, it's similar going from a four-legged, fully terrestrial mammal to an organism that can complete its life cycle out at sea, uh, give birth there, suckle the young, dive down a thousand feet or so, hunt fishes, etc. Just how many changes are we talking about here? I would say from 10,000 to 20,000, maybe more traits had to change. Could unguided evolution engineer that many changes in the time allowed? How about even a single new body part? Let's say the origin of tail fluke. So if you imagine, say, that two genes are involved, according to some estimates, that would take about 43 million years for those two changes. There simply is not enough time. In this case, we can prove mathematically that it is impossible that Darwinian evolution was the mechanism by which these supposed whale transitional forms evolved in this series. In other words, Darwinian evolution can't even engineer a tail fluke in the time allowed, never mind the tens of thousands of changes needed to convert the land mammal into a fully operational whale. So if Darwinian mechanisms can't get it done in the time available, what can? Stephen Meyer, author of the New York Times bestseller, Darwin Stout, explains. Whenever you see new forms of life arising, you also have to have new information. It's very much like in our computer world. If you want to give your computer a new function, you have to provide information in the form of software. And something very similar is true in life. If you want to build a new form of animal life, you have to have new organs and tissues. But new organs and tissues require new genetic information and other forms of information. And this information has to come from somewhere. We know it where it does come from. If it is software programmers, if it is architects, if it is engineers, if it is artists, they are all capable of creating something complex and new because they are intelligent minds. And intelligent minds are the only causes we know in the whole known universe which are capable of creating this effect. This is not based on an argument from ignorance, but it's just based on a rational inference to the best explanation. Scientists have been studying the fossil record for hundreds of years, and the evidence is now clear. If we just take off our materialist glasses and look, living things full of function, purpose, and design do not just appear by accident. A mind played a role in the creation of new forms of life, including you and me. We are, we are not, not materialists. materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer.